Well, hello, everybody. Um, we're really excited to have you here with us today. The Southern Alliance for Clean Energy is pleased to host the Southeast Coastal Climate Networks webinar series. My name is Erin Cameron, and I am the Development and Outreach Coordinator for SACE. I will be your facilitator for today's webinar. Um, thank you very much for attending, and your interest and support are very critical to the work that we do, so we really, really appreciate you being on this call today. We will be recording this webinar, so all of the lines have been muted in quality. I encourage you to type in your questions throughout the presentation using the questions option on your control panel. We will then answer the questions in the order they are received at the very end of the presentation. And now I would like to turn the presentation over to Chris Carnival, Safe Coastal Climate and Energy Coordinator. Thanks, Erin, and thank you everyone for attending the webinar today. My name is Chris Carnivale, and I'm the manager of the Southeast Coastal Climate Network. As you can see on the current slide, the Southeast Coastal Climate Network is a coalition of individuals and organizations spanning the coastal southeast who are working on coastal responses to climate change. We have members as far north as Maryland and as far west as Louisiana. The purpose of the network is to bring voices together, to trade information, and to synergize our efforts. The Southeast Coastal Climate Network is hosted under the Southern Alliance for Clean Energy. Our largest tool is our group site website, which is an online platform that enables members to send group emails, post discussion topics or relevant news to discussion boards, and use a shared group calendar. If you're interested in joining the network and using these tools, please just visit the web address on the screen now, seccn.groupsite.com, and click Join This Group Now. For those of you on the webinar who are already members, I want to encourage you to use these tools to get help, help you get your message out. The purpose of the group is to encourage communication and collaboration, and you have a receptive group of people at your fingertips. So please don't be shy and use the web tools to your heart's content. Another great tool we have is our webinar series, of which today's webinar is a part. Today we're joined by Chris Berg, South Florida Conservation Director for the Nature Conservancy, who will show us the Nature Conservancy's new tool for planning for sea level rise. Chris was raised in the Florida Keys and received a bachelor's degree in environmental conservation from Prescott College in Arizona before embarking on a series of internships and seasonal positions with government natural resource management agencies and the Nature Conservancy in Florida and New England. In 1999, he returned home to the Keys to manage the Conservancy's preserves and assist other natural resource managers with terrestrial conservation work. Soon he assumed land acquisition, marine conservation, and overall Keys program management duties before becoming the South Florida Conservation Director. Using science-based conservation practices from site-specific prescribed burns to regional marine protected area network design, he works to enable the Florida Keys, South Florida, and similar coastal systems to resist and adapt to the impacts of global warming, sea level rise, and more localized threats to biological diversity and social stability. With that, I'll turn it over to Chris. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, again, this is Chris Berg uh, joining you from Big Pine Key in the fabulous Florida Keys. And you should be able to see my uh, cover slide here. I'm going to do a very brief PowerPoint introduction to some of the work that the Nature Conservancy has been undertaking here uh, in the last few years before uh, the main event today. We'll be giving you a quick tour and tutorial of our new Florida Keys uh, future scenarios mapper a part of the Nature Conservancy's CoastalResilience.org website. So um, I understand that sometimes uh, there's a lag between me clicking buttons and you seeing it, so I'll try to pace myself. Um, here you've got my contact information, and I certainly welcome any follow-up uh, to this presentation or this webinar uh, via email or telephone. You can find a lot of our information online as well, and I'll show you those websites later. The uh, Florida Keys, my home and my primary uh, professional focus, has been a uh, priority for the Nature Conservancy for many years, since really 1971 when we started to do conservation land acquisition here. And uh, we continue to this day to have an office now located on Big Pine Key, right about over here. Um, this map just shows you a number of the different places that we've worked over the years to both acquire conservation land and subsequently to either manage it ourselves as nature preserves or uh, through transferring it to public agencies from the federal, state, and local government level. Um, we've worked to help uh, manage that property, whether it's through fire management, invasive species control, wetlands restoration, et cetera. And then the darker blue outline that you 
the around the Florida Keys is the boundary of the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary, a uh, large uh, marine protected area uh, full of uh, multiple uses, all sorts of fishing, diving, and uh, other uh, boating practices, but also some fully protected zones. And our marine work uh, has actually been a big focus for me over the over the recent and and my program over the recent uh, decade or so. So we've got a big uh, investment here, so to speak, and sea level rise, coastal storms, and the impacts of climate change in general are uh, a great concern to us. The uh, Keys are just about as exposed as anywhere on on the planet to uh, rising sea levels, uh, hurricane impacts, and the coral reef ecosystem offshore of the Keys is super sensitive to uh, warming ocean temperatures, uh, ocean acidification, and associated impacts. So we have a lot to uh, a, a lot to lose as the climate changes and as we undergo impacts. And also, I think uh, hopefully a lot to share with the rest of the world as we do our best to cope with those changes. <clears throat> Just to touch on a few, I mentioned the coral reefs. Uh, as the oceans warm, we're seeing more coral bleaching and diseases. Uh, we have, in partnership with a lot of public agencies and universities and other NGOs, a group called the Florida Reef Resilience Program, or rather an effort called the Florida Reef Resilience Program, which is uh, focused on coral reef conservation in the face of climate change. You can learn a lot more about that at this website, frrp.org. Sea level rise, of course, uh, is big for us. Uh, the average elevation in the Florida Keys is less than four feet and four feet above sea level. So when you look at the tide gauge at Key West, which is one of the longest running records of tide in our country, and you see about nine inches of sea level rise over the past century, uh, it's, it's easy to imagine how not only an increasing or a, a continuation of this trend would be a problem, but in fact the accelerating rate of sea level rise that we are experiencing and that scientists predict to continue to accelerate is a real real problem. Uh, coastal storms, uh, you know, we actually have been quite lucky here, uh, or we were quite lucky here from the late 60s until about 1998. Uh, we had a big spell without storms. And then in 1998, we had a big surge and, and impacts from Hurricane George. And then most recently, all these photos on the screen now are from 2005, October, uh, when Hurricane Wilma visited us. And, uh, you know, the photo here with the palm trees on the upper left is U.S. Highway 1. It's the one and only road into and out of the Florida Keys uh, at Key West under about seven feet of, of storm surge. Now that leaves uh, some you know, acute uh, impacts. Uh, including coastal erosion, like you see on the upper left, destroyed or damaged vehicles, homes, property, et cetera. Uh, really serious impacts to our ingress and egress to the to the region through the highway. But you know we can bounce back from these. We've done it a number of uh, times. But sea level rise uh, should is predicted rather to make these more common, perhaps more severe, and uh, you don't bounce back from sea level rise. It, it comes and does not go away again like a surge, naturally. So we started to tackle this issue pretty aggressively about 2005. And in 2009, we released this report. I'll show you later a link where you can download this if you're interested in it, which was an initial look at the changing shorelines and terrestrial habitat uh, distributions, and also, in a crude way, property value impacts uh, based on variety of different sea level rise scenarios that were then current um, and also you know began to propose both the resilience and adaptation responses. I won't dwell on that except to say that with better data a couple of years later uh, in partnership with these principal investigators from Florida International University we were able to refine the property value and uh, human population impacts quite a bit and again uh, I'll show you a link how to download this if you're interested. We've been, you know, we are the Nature Conservancy. We're quite focused on natural areas and native species. Uh, so we had this symposium in 
2011 to focus on just what might be done about uh, coping with uh, sea level rise in particular, and the results of that can be found online at this website. Again, you'll see this again. Uh, but here what I'm really going to show you and focus on here today is the new uh, Florida Keys web mapping application available on coastalresilience.org. And this coastalresilience.org website is uh, managed by the Nature Conservancy's Global Marine Team. It has a variety of different um, information sources uh, at, at the home page and then in these different geographies of which the Florida Keys is only one. And here to just whet your appetite, when you go to the coastalresilience.org slash geographies slash Florida Keys future scenarios map, this is Key West. And it, it, you can really select from a huge variety of different features of interest and a variety of different inundation scenarios and depict those and query them for information and so forth. I'll show you how to do that. But just to give you an example, we have uh, the different colors here. The palest blue is what Hurricane Wilma's storm surge was like approximately, not precisely, but approximately like in 2005. And then the, the darker and darker colors of blue over here shown on the legend and on the map are the uh, one, two, three, and four feet of sea level rise above current mean high or high water. So the high, highest tide of the day on average over the vital epoch. Um, excuse me. I'm just uh, minimizing some things that are popping up here. So um, this is uh, to give you an idea of the level of detail. And, and now I'm going to switch over and, and uh, go to that website and show you how it works. And please, as we're going along, if you think of questions or if you um, have specific areas that you'd like me to focus on, uh, toward the end of this hour, you can type those into the chat box or the question box, and Aaron will then uh, feed those to me at the end of the talk. So bear with me while I load this up. Oh, there's my kid. Okay, coastalresilience.org. Again, this is the um, global marine team of the Nature Conservancy's website focused on all things uh, relevant to uh, adapting to and minimizing the impacts of both uh, sea level rise, coastal storms, and other uh, associated uh, impacts. There's quite a lot of information here on the home page alone and lots of other links to different tools that have been developed for different places, but I'm going to take you now to the geographies button. And here you see a variety of different uh, geographies. New York and Connecticut, uh, the uh, coastal region of Long Island Sound was the first place where this tool was developed. And subsequently, uh, having seen its utility, other geographies have gotten uh, quite involved, including mine here in the Florida Keys. Um, so just to make the point, uh, a lot of people have been asking, why only the Florida Keys? Why haven't you also tackled the rest of Florida? And it's uh, a matter of time and resources. And you know, we would love to be able to develop this sort of um, uh, tool for the rest of Florida. But in the meanwhile, there is a lot of information, a lot of similar information available at the Gulf of Mexico Decision Support site, available through this, uh, this button right here. So. Um, here, I'll click the Florida Keys, and there's some background information there for you, and a little bit more background information in this issue tab. I don't expect you to read that. It's just a bit of facts and figures about our situation. Those can also be accessed over here on the left-hand menu, along with this Resources button, or Resources Information. And here is where you can find the links to all of those reports that I mentioned, the initial estimates and the FIU study, the information from our <coughs> uh, Natural Area Native Species Workshop, and lots, lots more, uh, both about the Keys here, about Southeast Florida or South Florida in general, and then some very general stuff that's uh, relevant to all, all parts of the world. I think uh, I'll make a point of noting that 
Monroe County, which is the, the county of the Florida Keys, is part of a four-county uh, collaborative effort called the Southeast Florida Climate Compact. And you can learn a lot of information about that here at, at this general button and some of its more specific things, like uh, the recently completed action plan for our region, unified sea level rise projection for Southeast Florida, and vulnerability analysis for this region are all available here or just by searching this on the web. Um, that group uh, has been really instrumental in, in helping uh, Monroe County, which is compared to Miami-Dade, Broward, and Palm Beach County is quite small, uh, to uh, up its, uh, raise its game, so to speak, on sea level rise adaptation in particular. So to the future scenarios map, when you click on that, uh, in order to access it, you'll need to accept the terms of the disclosure and, and uh, assuming you do that, you'll be able to get into it. Uh, this is as good a time as any to mention that this mapping uh, tool runs best on a Google Chrome browser or a Safari browser or a Firefox browser. Doesn't really run very well on um, Windows Explorer, unfortunately. Uh, however, these browsers are free and downloadable and make it run much more smoothly. So you'll notice uh, right away that we're not at the Florida Keys. We're at a picture of the entire, a uh, map of the entire globe. Uh, so to get to the Keys, you will go to this Geographies button at the top, Flood Scenarios, Florida Keys. Click, 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 and then it's going to zoom you into the Keys. I personally am not a super high-tech uh, guy. I'm more of a more of a natural area manager and uh, uh, do other things as opposed to fiddle with GIS and mapping technologies. But after using this a little bit, uh, I find it fairly intuitive, and I think that anybody that takes some time to get to know it will find it easy to navigate. Uh, but it's not. Uh, it does take a little bit of time. So here's the Florida Keys. Just off the map to the north is Miami. This is Elliott Key in the northernmost and Key West here in the southern southwesternmost region. So there are a couple of uh, general things I want to introduce you to. Over here on the left is what's called map layers, or you might think of it as features of interest. Right now, all these global uh, features of interest are, are available. I'm going to minimize that. And, and leave behind the Florida Keys features. You can see there are quite a lot of them. They're grouped into different categories like habitats, land use and other management boundaries, social and economic considerations, and then the inundation scenarios. And then under each one of those, you've got a variety of other uh, items. So here's an example. I'll click on the analysis extent. And this draws a sort of purple colored, pink colored line to show you where the region of um, analysis was for the Florida Keys, from Key West again all the way up to Elliott Key. And also notice that when we clicked on that here on the left, it displayed what's, what's being depicted in this legend. And I'll make this larger because as we add things, uh, they will automatically be added to the legend. So that is a quick introduction to features of interest. There are all sorts of them, and I'll show you some of the specific ones in a bit. And notice at the bottom, inundation scenarios can be selected from here, or you can select them from this flood scenario tab at the top. And depending on what you're trying to look at, sometimes it's easier to see what by selecting from this versus the uh, inundation scenarios here. But it shows you the same thing. Uh, so here, for example, uh, you can select none, that would be no flood scenario, or you can select one of the sea level rise scenarios, one, two, three, or four feet of sea level rise, or you can select from the uh, Hurricane Wilma-like storm, not precisely Hurricane Wilma, but one with its uh, same basic parameters, size and forward speed and uh, minimum central pressure, et cetera, et cetera. You can click on that, or you can click on that storm plus one, two, three, or four feet of sea level rise. Now, uh, let's see also the properties here. If you click on that, and if you click on that on any of these, you're going to get a properties um, pop-up box that you can then click on what's in it and learn more about where that data came from. 
So this is, in essence, the, um, the list of references. Uh, you can also, in some cases, get to the metadata. In most cases, get to the metadata. So this uh, explains to you how we developed our flood scenarios. This is uh, relatively technical. Uh, some people will find it very interesting, and others will never want to look at that. Um, and then these things, you can just minimize them if they get in the way. Let me show you one where you'll be able to see the metadata. So here's the Key Largo cotton mouse focus area. This is one of the numerous uh, very rare or endemic species that are found in the Florida Keys. Um, and when you, when you click on it, uh, the brown area that appeared on the map is where the habitat, the potential habitat of the species is found. And when you click on this, you'll get the properties which explains where the data generally came from. If you want to go deep, you can click on the metadata button and get uh, all you could ever want to know about where that data came from. Uh, I won't uh, dwell on this, but it's, it's all in there. You can figure out where we got it um, and how accurate it is and so forth. So let's see. I'll, I'll uh, take away the cotton mouse and I will show you the what? So the Keys tree cactus. This is a rare plant that's found in the Keys in our upland uh, forests and our tropical hardwood hammocks. It shows up well here in this gold color throughout the Florida Keys. It's not necessarily where the plant is found, but where it could be found. Um, I'll click on parcel boundaries just to show you what's available here. Every one of those black lines is the, the lot line of a, a parcel ownership in the, in the Florida Keys. Uh, fire stations. You know, you, I won't make it too busy, but just to give you an example, we've got all sorts of different things. Schools, and those show up with different icons. Uh, now, rather than, rather than select from the flood scenarios here, I'll be using these up here. But first, I'll zoom in to give you an idea of how uh, detailed this information actually is. Close this. Um, and to zoom in, there are a couple of ways to do it. There's a plus button up at the top. You can zoom in. The minus button zooms you out. The arrow zooms you to the most recent uh, view that you had. But this uh, zoom rectangle button, if you click on it, enables you to drag and click uh, and get more and more and more zoomed in if that's what you want to do. And while I'm showing you the features in the upper right here, uh, you can also change the background. Right now, what we have is a basic sort of roadmap. I tend to like to go to the imagery, which is a satellite image, but you can also use any of these that, that are, help you uh, determine what you're trying to determine. So here's the satellite imagery, the key tree cactus habitat, parcel boundaries are the black lines. You can see the, the fire station on Big Pine Key. Uh, the other stuff is not, not uh, in this window. But um, I'll zoom you right into my neighborhood just because I know it best up here at the north end of Big Pine Key, and then I'll show you some uh, flood scenarios. Maybe I'll make it just a little bit bigger. Okay, flood scenarios. Give me one foot of sea level rise. Now the new blue color on the map is uh, the new uh, mean higher high water with one foot of sea level rise. Now let me explain briefly the difference between uh, when, when people say what's the sea level today, they often are thinking about the mean sea level, the average relationship of the uh, ocean's edge to the land's edge. Um, that is a, a useful measurement, but from an ecological perspective and really from a social perspective, the higher high water, which is the highest tide of the day, is a more relevant uh, feature. Uh, because if, for example, here's, here's my house on Big Pine Key in the middle of this little neighborhood. The, the mean sea level is a, not too much interest to me, but if the tide actually impinges upon my property once or twice a day, that starts to really get my attention. Um, so the highest tide of the day, averaged across the, the many years, uh, is the mean higher high water. And we projected forward one, two, three, four feet of sea level rise and the Wilma-like storm surge from mean higher high water. So here's mean higher high water plus one foot, the blue on the map. Notice that uh, you know here's the actual today's modern ocean, and this is the new shoreline 
around the edge of the big blue polygon. But also notice there's some little blobs of blue that appear out in the middle of what looks like high dry ground. Uh, those are low-lying uh, areas. Those are basically depressions in the landscape. And in fact, it's, it's likely that as sea level rises, these will uh, no longer be dry holes in the ground. They will be wet holes in the ground because the limestone substratum here, the ground is so porous that uh, there's actually seawater beneath the island. And uh, although there's some fresh groundwater held within the rock, um, the, it, that fresh groundwater goes up and down with the tides on, on the tidal um, cycle. So with sea level rise, we're going to see inland flooding uh, taking place remote from the actual uh, leading edge or, or, or coastline, which would now be here. And it'll start to show up inland as well. Um, so let me show you two feet of sea level rise, just to give you a sense of how things change. This is a very low-lying island. Uh, eight feet above sea level is the highest ground that we've got on Big Pine Key, uh, natural, natural elevation, that is. Um, and the keys in general are quite low lying. 18 feet is our highest point, and that's a real exception to the rule. Most of it is less than four feet above sea level. Um, so now we're starting to get a little too close for comfort. Again, this is the mean higher high water, the highest average tide of the day. This is not uh, the highest tide of the year. So there will be tides, like right now, for example, we're having some very, uh, our annual highest tides of the year. And they would be substantially some six inches or more higher than what you see here. So they would come even further in. But uh, here, when I click off the zoom button, I can pan. I can grab and drag and pan. And I want you to notice that while my house was still high and dry with two feet above current sea level, I mean higher high water, the road that I need to drive on to get there is now inundated twice a day or at least once a day by the highest tide of the day. Now this is the kind of uh, thing that this tool can be used uh, to point out where our problems uh, are going to be, where they are now, where they're going to be with different levels of sea level rise or storm surge, and perhaps what we can start to, to do about them. And just as an example, uh, it's relatively straightforward to bring in additional gravel uh, and raise this roadbed and then pave it over again. and and keep uh, my vehicle from having to drive through seawater uh, once a day. But in the process of doing that, there are also opportunities to look at uh, creating culverts or other ways for the water to come and go for the natural communities like the mangroves and marshes to move inland and upslope as the sea rises, and, and consequently for the wildlife that depend upon those habitats to move inland and upslope and continue to uh, have habitat <clears throat> connectivity. Um, let me zoom out a little bit and I'll show you another, uh, oops, I'm zooming in. I'll show you another area of Big Pine Key to point out another sort of analysis or another sort of question that can be answered with this tool. This uh, is the southernmost portion of Big Pine Key. This is called Long Beach. And now that I've zoomed out, I'll zoom back into it. So Long Beach is a, a, a beach, as the name implies, all along the south shore of the island. There's this one road that leads out to it. Lots of uh, high-end homes out here uh, on this very narrow uh, peninsula of the island. And this orangey-colored habitat, the key tree cactus habitat, is uh, synonymous, really, with the coastal berm hardwood hammock habitat found in the Keys, the high uh, ground that's occupied by broadleaf species. And this coastal berm, uh, in addition to being important wildlife habitat, is actually also serving as a buffer against uh, coastal erosion, waves, and to some extent, storm surges, although all, only to a very limited extent. Uh, it's a buffer for these homes and for the road itself and the other infrastructure on this part of the island from, uh, from coastal hazards. So the Nature Conservancy and some of our partners are quite interested in identifying areas where nature, whether it's coastal berms like this or, or mangrove wetlands that serve to absorb uh, floodwaters or what have you, 
where these natural features are helping people or can help people cope with coastal hazards like storms and waves and uh, heavy rainfall, but also to some extent um, the slow creep of sea level rise. Um, so that's Big Pine Key. This is sort of the most rural uh, part of the Florida Keys. I'll take you to Key West now and show you the the uh, storm surge tool. It, it's a little more uh, interesting there where there's some higher ground. Basically on Big Pine Key the entire island was inundated by the, the storm surge. So Key West, uh, many of you have either visited or heard of it. It's the last island that you can drive to in the Florida Keys. It was the, it is the county seat and it was the sort of center of um, commerce and shipping and everything else in the Florida Keys until the highway was established in the in the uh, 20s. It's uh, the most populous area. About 25,000 people live there on this uh, three by five mile island or thereabouts here. Um, this is the higher portion of the island, Old Town Key West, and then New Town, so-called, and the airport. Let's see, I don't remember what I've got depicted here. I'll turn off all the all the sea level rise, uh, and I'll show you the storm surge, something like the storm surge from Hurricane Wilma in 2005, October. And this is pretty darn accurate. I was there. I happened to spend the hurricane at a friend's house on high ground and then uh, didn't think much of the storm because it was not very windy, not very rainy. And I then left and went to my parents' home down here, uh, down here exactly, where um, I helped them, sh you know, sweep knee-deep seawater out of the house along with mud and sea creatures and whatever else was in it. Uh, the surge was the real impact from, from Hurricane Wilma. And it really was an eye-opener for us in the Keys. We hadn't had anything quite like it for, for decades. We had a, a good brush with Hurricane George in 98. Uh, but before that, it had been 1965, I think it was, with, with Betsy. Uh, or was it Donna? I forget. One of those 60s storms gave us a good surge before my time. Um, so this was, the, this was the, something like the storm surge from Wilma. And here is what it would have been like if we had an additional foot of sea level rise. Oops. Did that go? Yes, it did. So here's what it would be like with an additional two feet of sea level rise. And as you can see, it just creeps up slope, creeps inland. Here's three feet. And finally, the fourth feet is the maximum that we uh, modeled here. And it's no surprise or no, it's no accident that the old timers that settled Key West settled on the highest, driest, um, safest part of the island. Not only was it high and dry and protected from coastal flooding, but it, is, it had fresh water and it was close to the deep water port over here. So as you can see, both uh, sea level rise and storm surge are a really big issue for us. Um, we think that the uh, coastal resilience future scenarios mapping tool will be very useful for uh, our community, both our, our government agencies in Monroe County and the municipalities that, that uh, exist in the Keys, but also our wildlife management agencies, the Fish and Wildlife Service, Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission, and others as they go about trying to cope with the changes that, that we're already facing, or, or rather cope with the risk of storm surge that could could happen at any time, and in fact uh, does happen uh, periodically, and then cope with the, the upward creep of sea level rise. Some of the work of the Southeast Florida Climate Compact is projecting, uh, I think conservatively, somewhere between three and seven inches of sea level rise by 2030, and nine and 24 inches of sea level rise by 2060. And any of you that are following this issue uh, will realize that there are a very wide range of uh, scenarios out there that suggest that it'll be, you know, X, Y, or Z. Uh, we're very much, um, the Nature Conservancy is very much convinced that planning for any one scenario is uh, the wrong way to go, that in fact you need to be planning for a 
range of scenarios and hopefully identifying um, mitigation or adaptation responses that will be effective uh, regardless of the amount or rate of rise. Uh, we, we certainly are seeing an accelerating rate and we're seeing an accelerating recognition of the fact that we have an issue. Our uh, county government, as I said, has joined the Southeast Florida Climate Compact with the other Southeast Florida county governments. Uh, the city of Key West, which uh, is on the screen now, is uh, quite active. The city of Marathon in the Middle Keys is uh, quite active and quite uh, focused not only on adaptation responses, but also on what they can do uh, at the local level towards mitigation of the root causes of these problems the uh, greenhouse gas emissions and deforestation and forest degradation that are the real roots of global warming, uh, which are the real roots of sea level rise. So um, what I think I'll do now uh, is just show you a couple of more features that, that can be displayed. And then for the last 15 minutes of our time, I'll answer your questions or um, if any of you have particular areas that you'd be interested in having me zoom to and, and display, I can do that. So um, let me turn these flood scenarios off and show you one of the, the sort of benefits of having the inundation scenarios or flood scenarios over here as well. When we use the flood scenarios tab at the top, we could only show one at a time. Uh, by using these, you can show them all, sort of one next to the other. So there's one foot. Let me expand this so you can see. Now the darker blue is two feet. There's three feet and still darker. And four feet of sea level rise, still darker. You can do the same thing with the surge plus one, two, three, four feet. And some people find this um, progression or this gradation way of displaying it useful. Uh, a couple of other interesting features. Uh, you can change to split view and compare some side by side. So let me, let me do this. Let me clear all. So I've got this clear all feature over here. And I'll, I'll put up uh, one foot of sea level rise on this map. And then I'll click to the right map. Wow, uh, whoops, I'll click back to the left map. I'll use this change to split view. So now I've got where, where I was here in Key West and then I'm back to the global. And I can use the sync maps feature up here on the left. Now that'll take me back to Key West. And if I wanna have it look the same, I'm gonna change the background back to the imagery. So over here I've got the imagery. Oh, I need to be, sorry, I need to select the right map and then fiddle with the background. Um, so here I'm showing one foot of sea level rise, that's the blue, and over here on the, on the right map I'm going to show you two feet. And this is just another way of looking at a side-by-side -side comparison. Another uh, potentially useful feature is the bookmark link. So if you click on bookmark link, it's going to create a URL which you can cut and paste into an email or a document or whatever you like and send it to somebody. And when they click on that link, they're going to, uh, the, the map uh, tool will open with all of the features that you selected uh, selected. So if you wanted to show them Unfortunately, it won't work with a split view, but if you wanted to show them one or the other, uh, you, could, you could do that. So that's, that can be useful. Um, another useful feature, let me turn back on the parcel boundaries. And as an example of this information tool, the I button up here on the top right. So once the parcels load up, you can click on one of those parcels and get the parcel identification number if that's of interest to you or the address if that's of interest to you. This sort of seems like it might have gotten frozen. If it does that, 
you have to start over again by reloading. That's going to take you back to the beginning. Um, I don't know why that happens. It doesn't always happen, but when you get too busy, it, it sometimes does that. So um, back to the keys. Back to the parcel boundaries. Um, I'll zoom back in. Click on my house just for time's sake. So back to the imagery background so I can find it. And then the I button shows you that you know this is the parcel boundaries and if you expand it by clicking the plus it tells you the parcel identification number which is the you know how they track parcel um, parcels in our county and the address there was other information available in this in this um, data set from the county uh, property appraiser including you know what I paid for my house and what its property value was uh, in 2008 and so forth we elected not to put that on there out of concern for people's privacy, but that information is available online on the property appraisers database using a similar map server. But um, those are that's a quick uh, tour of, of the sorts of information that's available, the sorts of things that the Nature Conservancy is um, thinking about doing with this tool. And we're hoping that our partners in, in, in wildlife management and county county uh, government, municipal government, and others are going to want to pick this tool up and get to know how to use it for whatever their uh, particular interests may be. And as an example, uh, the road system in the Keys is um, aging and needs to be upgraded. So if they can look at, at their, uh, their maintenance schedule or their repair schedule for the roads and bridges and use this tool or something like it to project forward and go ahead and plan for at least a foot. Uh, a foot would be very uh, conservative, in my opinion. And go ahead and build as though that foot were already here or basically on our doorstep. They could probably save some money in the long run by not having to go back and raise that road 10 or 20 years from now. Um, a wildlife example would be with the key deer, which uh, the Big Pine Key, where we're zoomed into now, is the heartland of the federally endangered key deer habitat. And land acquisition decisions, land management decisions um, about which wetlands to restore and so forth uh, can really be informed by this sort of fine scale information about uh, which habitats are where, which animals are using which habitat, how sea level rise and storm surge uh, will affect them. So uh, that leaves us about 15 minutes. And if I understand correctly, Aaron will serve me questions. And I'll be happy to answer them. Thank you all. OK, Chris, can you hear me? I can. Great. So we do have a couple of questions here. And I do encourage anyone else on the, um, who's on the line to please um, chat in your questions using your control panel. Or if you'd like um, Chris to show you anything specific using this tool, just go right ahead and type that in. So our first question, um, when a new or retrofit project comes in for review, at what elevation does the building get set at? FEMA and VGD or projected flood inundation maps? Um, currently, the only, uh, the only firm uh, rules are based on uh, FEMA. Uh, Monroe County has recently started to look at its own infrastructure investments and, and build or plan uh, for a, a higher uh, base elevation uh, because of their recognition of the realities of sea level rise and storm surges. Down on Stock Island here in the lower Keys, right next to Key West, they are planning to uh, rebuild a fire station. And they're going to build it higher than they need to in this area because of their recognition of this issue. Okay. Are you ready for another question? 
I am. Okay. Um, is data available for maps of other Florida coastal areas such as St. Petersburg or Tampa? There are other uh, sea level rise visualization tools that do cover those areas. The NOAA Digital Coast, um, uh, I don't know precisely what they call it, Sea Level Rise Viewer, for lack of a, uh, the accurate term, uh, covers all of the, the coast. Um, the Climate, what is it called, Climate Works or Climate Central uh, Sea Level Rise Visualization Tool uh, does this. Um, some of the differences between those and this tool are all the other um, data that we've, we've layered in here, the features of interest that we are hoping that decision makers in the, in the Florida Keys are going to find uh, useful for their decision making. Uh, the Nature Conservancy is working uh, on developing a tool like this one, uh, which this one for the Keys in the Charlotte Harbor region of Southwest Florida. Charlotte, Charlotte County and Lee County. Um, we have done this in, in various other parts of the U.S. and are beginning to do it in various other parts of the world. Uh, there is information uh, that may be of interest uh, to the, the folks that asked about Tampa and uh, wherever it was, Sarasota, I think, on the Gulf of Mexico uh, geography of this uh, this platform, the coastalresilience.org platform, although that does not show different sea level rise uh, uh, scenarios, but it does show a variety of other, you know, where habitats are and where different infrastructure features are and so forth. Okay, great. Um, another question we have here, what are realistic mitigation plans you have that could actually save the larger homes from being overwhelmed? Have property values gone down because of this? And when will this too be available for Broward County? Um, a couple of questions there. Um, the, I'll, ask, I'll try to address the property value question first. There's no uh, clear line that I'm aware of between um, sea level rise and property value change. I, as a lifetime resident of this region, I'm, I'm quite confident in saying that there was a clear line between the Hurricane Wilma storm surge, which came at the very end of, of, of two very severe hurricane seasons. So those, those bad hurricane seasons and bad meant we got a lot of close calls in the Florida Keys for each year. And then we had this, this serious hit from Wilma. Uh, Right at that time, our property values in the Keys uh, started to decline fairly dramatically. And then we had the, the, the national and, and international um, real estate bubble bursting. And uh, so, so we sort of entered that recession earlier as far as housing values are concerned. And um, you, the question about you know, how, do you, how do you deal with a house that's vulnerable, I think there are a variety of answers to that. Um, Right now, the land use and land development regulations in the Florida Keys uh, strongly discourage, if not, uh, if not basically make impossible, uh, putting a new development in harm's way. So you can't, you can't build in, in mangrove wetlands, um, or for all intents and purposes, you can't. Um, and the uh, land development regulations require that a property that's damaged and loses more than 50% of its value as the result of a storm has to be rebuilt up to the modern uh, code and, and comply with current um, wind, wind codes and flood codes or flood uh, zones and so forth. Um, as to you know, what do you do with a house that's already in place, uh, back here on Key West where I told you my parents' house was flooded, it's a ground level house. It was built at a time when nobody had any, uh, any concern really for sea level rise. And it, it's built in what used to be a wetland that was filled and not filled very much. And it's no surprise that it floods from time to time. Uh, it's not at all uh, a palatable option, but raising homes, I mean, I don't mean raising R-A-Z-E, -E, I mean raising them up, raising them in elevation uh, is a, is a um, practical, if not a palatable or an affordable solution. But um, when you consider that uh, you need to 
comply with, with uh, current codes and, and flood zone regulations. If your home is damaged more than 50%, it, uh, it starts to become at least uh, in the realm of possibility. Um, most new homes, all new homes in the Florida Keys uh, today are built on stilts or built on significant mounds of uh, fill. So they're up and out of, out of harm's way to some extent. And there's actually a, an interesting uh, thread of this entire sea level rise and storm surge um, discussion, which is to identify how existing storm uh, preparedness regulations uh, actually may help maybe uh, having ancillary benefits or unanticipated benefits for sea level rise preparedness and then identifying uh, what needs to be done beyond those to continue to improve. I think there's a, a concern among many uh, in uh, the elected officials and, and other decision makers that sea level rise is a problem that's too large to solve. Um, that it is just uh, out of this, out of the realm of possibility to even get your arms around it. But if we've already essentially uh, not solved the problem of storm surge, but adapted ourselves, adapted our laws and our building codes and our lifestyle to periodic storms and storm surges, we, we're in a sense part way there. Maybe we're halfway there towards adapting to sea level rise, at least for the relatively near term. And uh, the question about Broward County, I think, um, we're very interested in, in expanding this. Um, my program is focused on South Florida in general with some overlap into the Caribbean and the Gulf. Uh, but the Southeast Florida area is a particular interest of, of mine. And that stems from our long running interest in the, the coral reef conservation work that we do that extends all the way up the Southeast Florida coast as far as Martin County. So I'd love to get there. Um, I'm exploring some, some avenues to do that. And whoever uh, had that question should feel free to contact me if they would like to uh, help accelerate that in some way. Great. Um, we have one more question, Chris. Um, how do we down the report that places an estimate on damages in the Keys due to sea level rise? This was from earlier on in the presentation. Mm -hmm. So um, I'll just take you back to that right now. There are, there are a couple. Um, let's see here. So here, when you're back at the coastalresilience.org geographies Florida Keys, instead of going to the future scenarios map, which we've been at, you can go to this resources button. And the first one here, the 2009, uh, was the Nature Conservancy's initial foray into that. And I will I say again that it was a very simplistic um, way of looking at uh, property value impacts. We basically took the best available elevation data at the time, and now, now there is better elevation data. We identified the elevation of the center point of every parcel, and we, in a very simplistic way, said, well, when the sea level covers that center point, we're just going to assume that the property value is zeroed out. It's a very crude uh, uh, estimate, and it is not taking into account any of the other myriad market forces that uh, create property value or a, a property's value on a given uh, day. Uh, but it was something. And it was uh, it is a significant number in the billions of dollars. Um, you might want to focus more on the updated 2011 assessment, which had the benefit of the best, uh, currently best available elevation data, the LIDAR data for all of the Florida Keys. And still, uh, we're in the billions of of dollars of uh, property value impacted uh, using the more sophisticated techniques and the, and the more fine scale data that, that we had available to us for this 2011 report. And then there are a variety of other reports here that, um, that touch on that issue, but mostly I would point you, if you could only read one, read this one, the Zhang et al. We just had another question come in. Are you ready for another one? Sure. OK. How will reef decline affect storm surges, and will that significantly affect the storm surges in comparison to Wilma? 
That's an interesting question, and it's another one of these uh, threads of this whole broad topic that I'm exploring. In fact, I'm, I'm having a conference call next week with some, uh, well, a, with a specialist in modeling wave attenuation or the, the absorption of wave energy by, by whatever, by reefs or oyster reefs or underwater breakwaters or what have you. Because I'm interested in that question, I, it's very clear, uh, you know, I've been listening to the weather reports down here my entire life and it's very common to hear that the, the seas, the waves are, you know, seven to ten feet outside the reef and three to four feet inside the reef and that's no, that's no, um, that's no fluke. It's because the, we, the reef breaks waves and absorbs wave energy. Um, even the biggest reef, however, is going to only have, it'll have some impact certainly, but only a limited impact on a storm surge, which is uh, simply above and beyond uh, normal uh, waves. It's a, a super wave, if you will. So even the best breakwater, even the best seawall, even the most uh, healthy and intact coral reef or mangrove forest is not going to stop a storm surge. It can perhaps help uh, help moderate its impacts to some extent, but primarily the benefits there are more for the, the regular waves, storm waves, and uh, we do a lot of reef restoration work in this program, and I'd love to be able to show that our restoration work uh, is helping regrow reef structure and breaking waves. Uh, I think we're some years out from being able to do that, but I believe the effect is there and the ability to, to document it is some years out. Okay, thank you, Chris. That's, those are all of our questions, and it looks like we're just about to wrap up on time. So thank you, everyone, for attending today's Southeast Coastal Climate Network webinar. SAFE is very excited to be a part in this webinar series, and we would like to thank all of our members on this call and encourage those of you who are not members to please join us today. For more information, please check out our website, www.cleanenergy.org, and I encourage you to also view our blog or follow us on Facebook and Twitter. So thanks, Chris, and thanks, everybody. Thank you all very much. Have a great rest of your day. Aaron and Chris, are you still on? Bye-bye.